Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you very much for coming. So this is Every Rose Has Its Thorn, the dark art of remote online social engineering. Uh, my name is Matt Wixey. I lead research for PWCK's uh, cybersecurity practice. Uh, I work on its ethical hacking team. Uh, I'm a part-time doctoral researcher at University College London. And uh, prior to joining PwC, I worked in a, a law enforcement agency in the UK leading a, a technical R&D team. So worth pointing out that what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is presented for uh, educational purposes only. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that this talk is not gonna um, really go into any technical depth about uh, exploitations of vulnerabilities. It's purely about uh, human psychology, human behavior, uh, and very kind of granular behaviors. So the reason I chose this topic and the reason I've been uh, researching this for the past few months is that, uh, as you'll see, ROSE is a, quite an uncommon attack vector. It's fairly new. There's been a kind of handful of case studies, but no real, uh, as far as I know, in-depth exploration of it. Uh, I'm also interested in the, the kind of process of constructing personas online, um, as you can kind of see by this quote. Um, so that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. So I'm gonna start off by defining what ROSE attacks are and putting them in the context of online deception. Uh, I'm then gonna cover ROSE for attack, uh, ROSE for defense, um, how ROSE can be used by defenders against attackers, and then I'm gonna sum up and uh, kind of give some ideas for future research in this area as well. Okay, so ROSE defined. Um, so it's worth uh, looking at kind of traditional online deception types, and you'll be familiar with most of these, uh, starting from the left. Uh, trolling, if you're interested in trolling, uh, Matt Joyce gave a, a brilliant talk on this a few years ago at DEF CON, where he talked about sophistry and various logical fallacies that are used for trolling. Uh, moving across to sock puppetry and astroturfing, which is the creation of uh, kind of lightweight short-term profiles to give weight to some position, whether it's kind of marketing or political. Uh, and then there's fishing as well, so uh, mass fishing, spear fishing, whale fishing. Now, um, my bachelor's degree was in uh, English language and literature, and I'm still really interested in linguistics. Uh, I have a weakness for really bad puns as well. So um, I think the whole kind of taxonomy around phishing is really interesting. So as a quick sidebar, I'm proposing some new additions to that taxonomy around that kind of marine theme. Uh, so there's octo phishing. Uh, this is just when you target eight people at a time. Uh, that's literally it. Uh, there's crab fishing. This is when you have uh, two attackers fishing a target at the same time, so it's a pincer movement. Sorry. Uh, there's Loch Ness monster fishing. This is when uh, you don't even know that your targets exist, but you once saw a very blurry black and white photograph of them. Uh, there's dead sea fishing. This is when your targets don't even have uh, internet access. And then uh, my favorite one is Kraken fishing. Uh, this is a very high risk uh, strategy where you fish one huge mythical target uh, in a doomed attempt. So your entire fishing infrastructure is completely destroyed and uh, the vortex claims your folly. Okay, and then there's catfishing. So I've looked at catfishing separately because rose attacks are a kind of variant of catfishing. So catfishing involves uh, the creation of long-term false personae. Uh, typically targeting just individuals who may be randomly selected or they may be um, specifically selected. And historically, the motivations for catfishing have either been psychological, um, so attention seeking or romantic, or they've been criminal um, with regards to kind of fraud and extortion. So ROSE, if you consider it as a variant of catfishing, uh, involves much the same kind of tactics. It's long-term, it's self-referenced, highly customized towards particular individuals a highly interactive approach. It may involve multiple false personae that interact with each other to kind of um, give a, a synthetic network. Um, typically, it will focus on business-related platforms um, and targets, and the objective of it is to compromise security, whether that's through a malicious attachment, uh, whether it's through trying to um, get a target to divulge sensitive information, something like that. So as a quick aside, uh, as a previous um, literature student um, and someone who enjoys reading, um, there are some interesting parallels between Rose attacks and, and writing fiction. Um, so a, an attacker has to create a believable character and a backstory. They have to uh, have a realistic dialogue going on. They have to drive a plot forwards, uh, make that highly interactive, and then wrap up in a realistic way in the end. So there's a kind of opening there for people from liberal arts backgrounds, I think, and creative backgrounds to kind of uh, look into this 
So I'm going to run through a few case studies here. Now, these aren't necessarily rose attacks, but they're examples of uh, long-term online deception. Some of the elements of these will uh, kind of speak to the uh, methodology of rose attacks a little bit later. So the first is Mark and John. Uh, Mark and John were schoolboys in the UK in 2003. Uh, they knew each other in real life. They were from the same area. And over a period of months, John created multiple personae on uh, MSN Messenger, uh, all of which were targeting Mark and speaking to him. Those personae uh, ranged from prostitutes and drug dealers through to uh, MI5 agents. Now, the uh, plots that John put together were extremely convoluted and complex. You had multiple characters corroborating things that other characters had said. There's a really unclear motivation for why John did this. Uh, there were sexual elements to this case study, both physically and online. But the uh, case study ends with um, one of John's personae, who is a high-ranking uh, MI5 officer, persuading Mark to kill John uh, for various convoluted reasons. And uh, Mark was persuaded to do it. He met John in public in Manchester in the UK and stabbed him and then called him an ambulance. Uh, I don't mean that he pointed to him and said, you're an ambulance. I mean, he phoned an ambulance for him. Um, <clears throat> so uh, John survived. Mark was uh, convicted of attempted murder. And John, uh, to my knowledge, remains the first person uh, ever in the UK to be convicted of inciting their own murder. Um, so if you're interested in that, I've put a link to a very detailed article about this case study that goes into uh, quite a lot of detail about it. It's really interesting. Uh, Robin Sage, um, so this was presented at Black Cat a few years ago by a researcher called Thomas Ryan. Uh, you might have heard of this one before. Um, this profile image was taken from an adult modeling site. Various profiles were created. And over a period of 28 days, this profile gained uh, about 300 connections and friends, um, mostly from within various uh, elements of the US government. And this profile received uh, invitations to speak at conferences, review academic papers, uh, invitations to dinner and drinks and that kind of thing. Now, crucially um, here, the profile claimed to have uh, accreditations with various institutions and qualifications, that kind of thing. Some of the people that Robin Sage approached uh, tried to verify those credentials uh, and found that they couldn't. So they knew that something was wrong, that this person was not who they were claiming to be. But crucially, they didn't share those warning signals. Um, they just declined the, the invite. And then finally, there's um, this particular case study for which uh, the movie Catfish is based on. So you'll be familiar with this one. Uh, if you're not, uh, it starts with a photographer befriending a, an eight-year-old girl online, um, beginning an online relationship with that girl's uh, older sister. And it turns out that the, uh, the mother of the young girl was the older sister the whole time. Um, the interesting thing about this is the amount of profiles that were maintained by one person. So there were about 15 uh, different social media profiles that were all talking to each other to give this impression of a, a close-knit social network. Okay, so uh, that's Rose defined. What about attack? Why would attackers want to do this? Well, uh, a big reason would be to bypass um, technical controls and to bypass the effects of user education and awareness. Um, as we'll see a little bit later, rose attacks also potentially give an attacker multiple opportunities um, at an attack. And um, rose attacks also enable an attacker to bypass filters. Now, when I say filters, I'm not talking about technical controls. Uh, I'm talking about a set of thresholds that we all have um, when we determine what is suspicious and what isn't that inform our kind of reaction to various stimuli and experiences. So this is based on research in personality psychology, um, something called the Cognitive Effective Personality System, which states that um, due to our unique upbringings and training and education and experiences, we have distinctive yet consistent ways of responding to things. Uh, and that can be applied to anything, um, even emails that come through to us. So this is an email that came into my inbox a while ago. Um, now, this is an example of mass phishing. And obviously, mass phishing doesn't really make any attempt to bypass people's filters other than in a very crude sense, so self-selection. So when I see this email, uh, I see this. I see uh, spelling mistakes. I see grammatical errors. I see things that just don't seem realistic. I see a dodgy email address. Um, so I wouldn't respond to this or fall for it. The advantage that Rose gives an attacker is that because it's designed um, to target a specific individual, it can be designed specifically to bypass that person's filters. Uh, and I really like this quote by Philip K. Dick, which I think sums that up. So we are all susceptible in some way to some form of social engineering. It just depends how it's constructed and what it is. 
So this is an example of an email that I've written to myself uh, after a, a rather brutal self-assessment of my own character flaws. Um, this isn't licensed for you guys to start emailing me after this talk and trying to, uh, to bypass me, but when I see an email like this, I see this. I see um, research that's been done into talks I've given, very specific elements of those. I see things that are relevant to my interests that are out there on social media about me. I see kind of reflections of my linguistic habits and, and characteristics. And I see a lot of identifiers there that would, uh, in real life, be backstopped um, by genuine details and, uh, and history. So I'm gonna go through uh, an outline of a, a rose attack, the methodology behind it. Um, and for each stage of these, I'm gonna uh, outline some specific steps that defenders could take to defend against them. So the first is research. So uh, an attacker would perform the same kind of research that you would expect from, say, a spear phishing campaign, but would go into a lot more detail. So they would be looking at um, not only kind of likes and dislikes, but also things like other platforms and profiles, relationships and family, um, and crucially at the bottom there, reactions, styles and motivations. So a person's reactions to various events online, uh, how they argue, how they respond to good news and bad news, um, their style in terms of their linguistic style, so how they write things, how they use kind of emoji and that kind of thing, and their motivations for doing particular things. Now from a defender's perspective here, um, obviously this activity would be occurring before any attack has been launched, so it's pretty difficult. You're talking about kind of preventative measures, but you can limit the amount of information that's online about you, which you hope people would do anyway. Uh, and there are various services you can use to kind of alert you when certain things have been searched for or reused. The attacker would then start to build their persona and build their profile, and they might do that by mirroring their target, particularly in terms of their linguistic style. Um, they would start looking for potential openings for contact, and they would try and make that profile look as realistic as possible. Um, so in terms of images, for instance, uh, historically with catfishing campaigns, uh, profile images have been stolen from genuine social media profiles. That doesn't have to be the case. So an attacker might edit or manipulate images, they might get them from behind some kind of paywall, uh, or they might, depending on their resources, create completely new images. From a defender's perspective, uh, in addition to the steps from the, the previous step, um, there are various things that a defender could do to try and work out if a profile image is genuine. They could do uh, reverse image search, they could look for um, evidence of manipulation, so error level analysis, glitches. Uh, they could use something called perceptual hashing, which is a measure of the similarity of an image, uh, and they could look at image metadata as well. At this point, the attacker would seek to give their profile uh, further credibility, perhaps by claiming that they've attended particular institutions, giving themselves employment history, uh, academic history, that kind of thing. They might also try and backdate their profiles, pre-age accounts, so that might involve uh, kind of automated bot posting for a period of several months before the human interaction starts. And then uh, from a more sophisticated point of view, attackers might try and develop profiles which realistically age over time. So that the attitudes, maybe political affiliations, tastes in music and film develop over a period of years. We're talking about kind of a really long game here. Uh, an even longer game would be if attackers create personae which in themselves are never used for attacks, but are portrayed as getting married, having children, and then the children of those profiles are used for attacks in 20 years time. So that's uh, playing the really long game and you're talking about attackers with extreme patience uh, there, but that's a possibility. For defenders, obviously brand new accounts are suspects. Um, a person who has no trace of social media uh, in this day and age at all until say a month ago is kind of suspicious. Um, you can examine backdating, it's not always 100% reliable. You might be able to check for early auto posting. Um, Crucially here, validation is probably the most important thing. So uh, if someone claims to have attended a particular institution or has a particular qualification, trying to verify that either directly or indirectly. Um, and as we saw with the, the Robin Sage example, the, the crucial part there is that findings are shared um, and kind of people are alerted to this. Uh, the defender might also seek to know if the uh, profile does have genuine knowledge of a particular institution or place. If they do, that's potentially valuable information for attribution. Uh, if they don't, if there are inconsistencies, then that's an opportunity as well, and I'll cover that a bit later on. Uh, 
Here, the attacker might start to build a synthetic network, so they might create multiple uh, false profiles which communicate with each other to give that illusion uh, of an actual social network. There are various technical things they can do uh, there to uh, A, achieve that, and B, to give that credibility. Um, really importantly here, the attacker would be looking to avoid something called profile contamination, which is where uh, elements of one profile bleed into another, particularly in terms of linguistic styles and behaviors. Defenders could adopt things like forensic linguistics or behavioral analysis to see if uh, perhaps multiple profiles are maintained by one human operator. They could look for inconsistencies, they could look for cultural indicators. So by cultural indicators, I mean um, slang and idiolect that um, is responded to inappropriately or, or kind of not in a, uh, an expected way. Then the attacker would seek to start establishing contact with the intended target. Now to start with, this would be peripheral. Um, so they would start with associates or even associates of associates by perhaps just liking the same kind of things in an attempt to get into the intended target circle of awareness, uh, as I call it. And this has parallels with uh, in, uh, examples of real life deception. So something like uh, Donnie Brasco, for instance, which was uh, an FBI agent going undercover in the mafia for six years. He didn't start out by going to mafia-connected bars and nightclubs and talking to mafia-connected people. He started by just hanging out at those places so that his face could be seen. He then started talking to, say, the bartender um, because he knew that the bartender would know the mafia-connected guys. So there's something there that he can reference later on. And at some point, the attacker is going to initiate direct contact with the intended target once this has been done. And again, to start with, that might be just liking or commenting on posts and content. Um, with the advantage that the attacker can preface that with reference to the peripheral contact. Defenders here would be looking to corroborate um, a profile with mutual associates. So they know that someone uh, is showing up in the news feed that they don't know, that they've never heard of, um, and they might ask their associates, how do you know this person, where do they come from? Then the attacker presents the hook which is the actual direct contact made to an intended target. Uh, and this is um, equivalent to the, the pretext uh, in a normal phishing campaign. This is what's gonna drive the interaction forward. So it might be a request for help or advice. It might be something that's gonna benefit the intended target. It might be romantic or sexual. Um, it might relate to business relationships. At some point, the attacker might shift over to the corporate email address of the intended target which is a point of weakness potentially uh, and something that, uh, an opportunity for defenders. So with defenders here, uh, once they receive this hook or once they become aware that someone has received this hook, this is where that self-assessment thing comes in that I mentioned earlier uh, with that email that I sent to myself about understanding what your filters are and where you might be susceptible and vulnerable. So what would kind of entice you to respond to something? If the attacker has uh, shifted over to corporate email or they've kind of asked to shift over to corporate email, then that's uh, a red flag. You can question why they want to do that. Additionally, the defender might consider, if it's a profile they are suspicious of, uh, sandboxing that person on social media. So deciding only to speak to them on one social media platform and not giving them uh, kind of access to others. The attacker is then going to establish and maintain contact over a period of time, and the length of time depends really on, on what the campaign is and what their objective is. Um, throughout all of this, their various multiple persona are going to adapt to whatever reality is they're working under. So if they're purporting to be from a particular location, then their communications uh, are going to uh, kind of cohere to that. So uh, they're going to cohere to time zones, to office hours in that location potentially. That's going to be supported by technical measures, so uh, IP addresses which are appropriate for that location. Uh, they're going to seek to build rapport and trust over this period of time and potentially even draw their target into this synthetic web that they've created uh, for two reasons. The first is that if the intended target becomes bored of speaking to the main persona, then there are kind of backup persona which can still engage with the victim. Uh, the other reason uh, might be that it potentially gives other angles for the attacker. So if the main pretext, the main hook, uh, doesn't work, for instance, then there are potentially other hooks that these other persona I can drop in there. For the defender here, again, there's uh, the possibility of using something like forensic linguistics or behavioral analysis to tie together multiple profiles. Uh, they can check for evasiveness uh, around video and face-to-face -face communication. So if a profile is, is, does not want to engage in those kinds of communications, 
uh, that's a potential red flag. Um, depending on the attacker's resources, there are steps they can take to try and synthesize some of those communications uh, or to uh, use a real person, uh, or they might seek to uh, provide some kind of plausible reason why they can't engage in those types of uh, communications. Then the attacker is going to try and prime the victim, uh, depending on what their eventual objective is. So um, they will, if their uh, eventual objective, for instance, is to get the intended target to open a malicious attachment, they may, over a period of weeks or months, send multiple benign attachments just to get the intended target used to the process of receiving attachments and opening them. This also means the attacker contains some uh, technical feedback, potentially, on what gets through particular endpoint controls and what doesn't. Um, the defender may um, try and uh, prevent this, detect it by questioning motivations if they're asked to do something. Um, if they get kind of questions on technical aspects, so if they're being asked if certain attachments got through consistently, um, then that could be a, a clue that this profile isn't genuine. And then finally, there's a payoff. So the attacker is actually going to launch their attack. Um, now, depending on what the uh, objective is, that, that will take a different form. After that attack, if it's successful, the attacker may continue to maintain contact with the target. Um, and that's been seen in a couple of case studies. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons why. It might be that at some point they want to launch a further attack. It might also be if they want to reuse that profile in future against a different target, it now has the added benefit of being corroborated by interaction with a genuine person uh, over a long period of time. If the attack doesn't succeed for whatever reason, then the attacker has um, multiple opportunities to send more malware or to, um, to try and get more information or whatever the objective is because of that trust and rapport that's been built up over the course of that. And there's uh, research that suggests, and I'll, I'll come on to it uh, shortly, that um, you know, even if the attacker at this point flags uh, an antivirus product, for instance, by sending through malware, that that may not be um, the, the end of their campaign. The intended target may not um, take that trust violation seriously because of the trust that's been built up over that period of time. Or the attacker's my profile might just disappear. It might be completely burned and just drop off, in which case that would be a, a big red flag for defenders. So I'm going to run through a couple of case studies of Rose uh, attacks seen in the wild. Uh, the first is Mia Ash uh, from last year, reported on by Dell SecureWorks. So Mia Ash um, was a photographer, a London-based photographer, various profiles on various platforms of social media. So there's a screenshot of her LinkedIn profile here. And you can see the amount of connections she's got. You can see that there's a, an education history, an employment history. Um, the profile image was stolen from a genuine profile, so a reverse image search would have revealed that. Um, the uh, education and employment history could have been verified as well. Uh, Mia Ash's profiles were developed for at least a year, engaged in communication with targets in the Middle East for at least a year as well. Um, and uh, what Mia Ash did after establishing that trust and rapport over these various platforms, asked her targets to open up an Excel spreadsheet that she sent to them uh, on their corporate email address, which had a malicious VBA macro in it. Uh, the second case study is uh, reported on by FireEye a few years ago um, in Syria. So uh, this was Skype profiles targeting various members of the Syrian opposition. Um, in this case, the uh, persona I sent malware disguises images. Um, and interestingly here, uh, after infections and after that kind of attack attempt, some of these persona I maintained contact with the victims to uh, elicit further information from them. There was also evidence of some pretty detailed research beforehand as well. So a lot of these false persona I would uh, coincidentally have the same or very similar dates of birth to the people that they were targeting as a kind of uh, conversational icebreaker. So uh, in terms of ethics and legality for Rose attacks, so um, I'm uh, not a lawyer. I'm not qualified to kind of give any legal advice. And um, Rose is a, a gray area. Um, and impersonating people online is a gray area. To my knowledge, it's not legal in the UK to pretend to be someone else online. That may differ in particular countries. Um, things like Rose attacks would almost certainly breach terms and conditions uh, of social media providers. Um, and it's worth noting here um, that there may be psychological after effects of this kind of attack uh, on the target, on the victim, um, particularly if the relationship has been particularly close or intimate. Um, there may be kind of um, some quite negative after effects requiring aftercare. Okay, so that was Rose for attack. What about defense? What options do defenders have and what kind of recourse do they have? 
So there are some big challenges with trying to defend against rose attacks. Uh, crucially, there's the fact that uh, much of the contact, because it takes place on, on social media or other platforms, is going to occur outside of working hours. It might occur, uh, occur on employees' own equipment um, and in their own time, and therefore kind of be outside of the remit of many defenders. There's also the fact that many uh, organizations want their staff to engage with people on social media, and employees are not uh, exclusively going to do that on corporate assets. They might do that on personal assets as well. So that kind of widens the attack surface for this kind of uh, approach, for the Rose approach, um, without really giving, kind of giving defenders any more to go on. So um, in order to uh, prevent and detect Rose attacks, it's uh, necessary, I think, to understand a bit more about deception and how deception works. So we lie all the time. Uh, everyone lies to each other uh, all day, every day. Um, we expect other people to lie as well. We know that other people are lying to us. Um, but despite that, and actually I'll take a quick show of hands here. Who, who thinks they're pretty good at knowing when someone else is lying? A few people? Okay, so research shows that we're actually really bad at it. Um, even though we know that people are lying to us all the time and we're lying to other people all the time, most people have only a slightly better uh, than, than average chance of knowing when someone else is lying. Uh, and that's even worse when it comes to online deception. Because we rely on uh, faulty cues, because uh, potentially because of the amount of uh, bad crime dramas that are out there, we kind of think that certain cues are telling us when people are lying when in fact they're not. And this is actually even the case with people who do this for a living. So uh, historically, research has shown that police officers, for instance, are not any better at detecting deception than the average person. Um, even if they're trained and experienced, it just makes them more likely to think someone is lying when they're not. Um, but they don't necessarily have a better chance of doing it. So why do we fall for it? Why do we fall for deception and for lies? Well, um, humans tend to have an inherent tendency to trust people. Uh, we want to reduce uncertainty if we're not sure about someone. Uh, we want to do that as quickly as possible. Uh, we have a bias towards the truth. We have a tendency to try and categorize people, um, particularly if categorizing them means we can trust them. Um, and we like um, to confirm our beliefs and our biases. Uh, and crucially here, I mentioned this earlier, if, if someone violates our trust, um, then we may just see that as an isolated event. It doesn't necessarily affect the amount of trust we have in someone. We just see it as a one-off and then continue to trust them afterwards. So there's a few theories I'm going to go through uh, very briefly about um, deception, about picking it up, about how it differs from platform to platform and person to person. So the first is interpersonal deception theory which basically states that deception is an activity which is goal-driven. And the specific goals uh, from a, a liar's perspective are, are twofold. There's the um, desire to achieve deception and then the desire to avoid detection. And uh, interpersonal deception theory basically states that this is a dynamic process, that the liar will continually adapt their behaviors and their strategies depending on the responses they get from the person they're trying to deceive. There's uh, expanded prominence interpretation theory, and this has uh, quite a lot of relevance for Rose attacks specifically. Uh, this theory basically states that uh, our assessment of whether or not something is trustworthy depends on the platform it occurs on uh, in an online context. So um, because Rose attacks uh, may involve kind of professional business networking sites and that kind of thing, uh, that may lead us to, um, to make a decision that someone is not lying when they are. Uh, a couple of theories here about uh, how the um, particular properties of a medium can influence communications and our perception of, of deception. So media richness theory um, basically says that um, there are particular properties of a medium which are going to influence the communications that happen on that medium. So a very rich medium, for instance, uh, involves kind of instant mutual feedback. Uh, you have verbal and nonverbal cues. So this would be something like face-to-face -face communication or video conferencing, uh, instant messaging to a lesser extent. And related to that is media synchronicity theory. Um, so this is purely about temporality. Um, so instant messaging, again, would be a highly synchronous uh, medium, whereas something like email is asynchronous. There's a delay in between uh, communications. And that is advantageous for someone um, engaged in a rose attack because they have time to refine and prepare uh, their deception and their presentation of it. <clears throat> 
Then there's communication accommodation theory. So this goes back to uh, the methodology I outlined earlier where I talked about um, trying to match people's linguistic styles and kind of mirroring and supplementing that. So communication accommodation theory, you've probably uh, heard of it in some uh, context before. It's where if we're trying to persuade someone or to gain someone's approval, we will adapt our linguistic style, our way of speaking, our vocabulary and that kind of thing to match the person we're talking to. So it's a similar principle to uh, body language, to people trying to mirror uh, someone else's body language if they're speaking to them. And uh, most interesting, I think, is the principle of cognitive load. So cognitive load um, is about the amount of mental stress that's placed on someone who is lying. So lying um, uh, neurally is a very complex process because a liar is trying to do multiple things at once. They're trying not only to suppress the truth, but also to uh, fabricate things, to distort things or omit things. They're trying to avoid detection whilst at the same time trying to achieve deception. And this leads to various uh, states of psychological and physiological arousal. Um, we're not too bothered about the physiological here, but the psychological is interesting. Um, and research has indicated that uh, police officers, for example, um, might be better at detecting lies who are cognitively overloaded, who are um, asked to perform some task in addition to lying, or who are having to answer more questions, uh, or something like that. So this is an overview of uh, the various strategies and processes that uh, a liar is going through. So um, the strategies a liar will adopt, um, firstly, they'll try and withhold information if they can, to, to not give out any information at all. If they're forced to, then the information they provide is going to be uh, potentially vague and uncertain. And then finally, there's non-immediacy. Uh, and by non-immediacy, I mean uh, a deceiver tries to distance themselves linguistically from the liar that kind of manifests itself in lies using uh, less first-person pronouns, for instance. Uh, and I'll, I'll come on to this in a little bit. So um, in terms of detection, then, there are two channels, two avenues for a defender or an investigator. One is uh, what we can call leakage cues. This is things that are um, unconsciously given out by a liar as a side effect of them lying. And then there are things that the liar is willingly transmitting. Uh, in an attempt to achieve deception. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as one researcher I think quite nicely puts it, there's no Pinocchio's nose. There's no 100% reliable indicator that someone is lying, either in person uh, or online. Because deception can change with what's at stake, it can change with the synchronicity and richness of the medium that's being used, uh, it can change with the motivation of the liar, so how motivated they are to, um, to avoid uh, detection. Uh, and it can also change according to the liar's experience, so how good they are at lying and how much practice they've had at it. That being said, uh, there's been a whole load of research done on various linguistic markers of deception online. Um, and uh, all the references for these are going to be at the end of the slide deck if you want to uh, read through yourself. But I've tried to summarize some of these. Now, these aren't 100% reliable, um, so there is kind of a caveat there. But these can give some indication that, that someone may be lying. So um, people who lie online are likely to delay less in their responses, to participate more in, say, group conversations, to, um, to, to, uh, to write more generally, to produce more words. Um, however, those words are going to be more informal and more uncertain. Uh, and again, this non-immediacy concept that I uh, spoke of earlier, where liars will use less first-person pronouns, less I, my, mine, that kind of thing, and more second or third-person pronouns. Um, the theory being that they're trying to distance themselves from the deception. Liars' communications may also be less diverse uh, and less complex so that they don't have to kind of keep track of too many things at once. Uh, really interestingly, liars' descriptions of experiences and events are likely to be less sensory, so less about what uh, someone felt or smelt or heard or saw, and more about cognitive processes that were experienced, so what someone remembered or analyzed, um, that kind of thing. It sounds obvious, but liars will avoid topics that they, they're lying about and will emphasize things they're telling the truth about. Uh, there is potentially a difference between the, uh, the way that motivated liars will communicate compared to unmotivated liars, and liars may use more negative emotion words as well. 
Uh, and then finally, liars may um, ask more questions, um, perhaps in an attempt to shift the focus from them onto the person they're trying to deceive. There's been some research which suggests that, contrary to what I, I just said, liars may use more first-person pronouns if they're anonymous, um, which is particularly interesting. So I think that's, um, an, that's interesting for two reasons. The first is it, it demonstrates that more work needs to be done in that area, I think, to kind of um, to work that out. But secondly, that these aren't 100% reliable, that they're not going to apply to everyone. Uh, there are also some markers of what's called cognitive complexity as well, which um, are kind of a symptom of a liar being cognitively loaded um, in attempting to lie. Okay, so forensic linguistics. Um, has anyone uh, done any forensic linguistics before? Do we have any forensic linguists in the room? Okay, good. So I can get away with my kind of lack of knowledge here. Um, so uh, traditionally, forensic linguistics, uh, it's been around for about uh, maybe 50 years, maybe a little bit longer. And it's based on the assumption, uh, very similar to the filters concept I mentioned earlier, that people have a consist consistent yet distinctive style of writing. Um, there are normally three categories of forensic linguistics, authorship, identification, so when you're trying to um, ascribe a particular piece of text to a known individual. There's authorship characterization, which is simply where you're building a profile of someone's writing style. And then there's similarity detection, where you're trying to find out how similar two different texts are. So typically, forensic linguistics looks at four categories. It looks at lexical, which is the number of words, uh, words per sentence, usage frequency, that kind of thing. It looks at syntax, um, so predominantly punctuation um, and maybe function words as well. Structural, so paragraph length and the number of paragraphs, and uh, content-specific words, um, which will change depending on the context. So uh, I'm not going to go into any depth on, in forensic linguistics. It's just this slide. If you're interested in it, uh, let me know and I can recommend some, some reading on it. So as an example of how deception can kind of manifest in written texts, uh, I've got this case study here. Now this is not related to Rose attacks, it's just an interesting example uh, and a real life example of how this works. So this uh, case study is about a guy called Diedrich Stapel. Um, he uh, was or is a social psychology researcher in the Netherlands. Uh, very eminent um, in his day, he uh, won several career prizes before the age of 30. And it transpired uh, a few years ago that he had uh, manipulated data in a number of his studies. He'd either completely fabricated it or he'd manipulated it. Um, and as a result, two researchers decided to look at all of his published papers and see if they could work out if there were certain markers in the fraudulent papers so that they could use that as a kind of distinguishing measure. And they found out that they could. Um, they kind of caveated it, that it wasn't 100% accurate. It was something like uh, maybe 60, 65% accurate. But the fraudulent papers did display certain characteristics which weren't there in the genuine papers. Uh, so that's just a, an interesting example of how um, linguistic markers can be used potentially in written text to, to indicate deception is happening. So to sum up, um, in terms of um, passive detection, Defenders can look for linguistic markers. There are some reliable indicators there, potentially. Um, something called the Undeutsch hypothesis, which basically states that um, fabricated experiences will be different than genuine experiences, and nonverbal behaviors as well. So this is more about the metadata of communications, about the frequency of posting, uh, what is posted when and how often. There's some research that suggests that those kind of nonverbal indicators can also uh, indicate deception as well. In terms of active detection, uh, defenders can try and increase the cognitive load on someone who they think is lying. So they can try and move uh, the persona to a more synchronous and richer environment where it will be harder for that person to keep up the act of deceit. Um, they can request more sensory information, ask more questions. They can try and emphasize particular elements that the, uh, the profile is tending to underemphasize. And they can try and introduce additional tasks, whatever they might be. Uh, all of that helps to increase the cognitive load and therefore increase the probability of the attacker um, making inconsistencies and errors. Interesting as well, in terms of active detection, uh, there's gaze detection. Um, so there's a number of studies which have indicated that uh, someone's gaze, how they kind of uh, look 
um, backwards and forwards, how their eyes move, is a reliable indicator of deception. Um, and some recent research indicates that that's the same in uh, video conferencing as well. So that's a, a potential opportunity. Okay, so that's rows for defense. What about kind of turning the tables? So I will kind of caveat this by saying that um, there are various kind of legal and ethical issues potentially with doing this kind of thing. We certainly wouldn't advocate you going out and doing it. Um, it's probably one for the lawyers to argue over, uh, and it's assuming there's no kind of conflict of interest with law enforcement or other uh, agencies. But it has been suggested previously that if you become aware that a profile that's speaking to you is false, if it's operated by, by someone um, who is attempting to deceive you, then you could do something like drip feed false information, you could introduce like canary information, um, or you could try and elicit information that could be used to try and attribute where that profile is um, and, and why it's trying to deceive you. So my late, last case study uh, is an example of this. Um, now this is about a woman called Shannon Rossmiller, um, who was uh, a district judge in the US. And shortly after 9-11, uh, she began creating multiple personae on various extremist forums um, and posed as an Al-Qaeda affiliate. Um, she uh, had pretty good setup, a pretty interesting setup. She had um, some persona who were more mature, who were older, who had been around for a longer time, and they were kind of referencing the younger persona. She tried to give each of them distinct uh, styles and ways of speaking, and once those profiles weren't required or they were kind of close to being detected, she would say that they had been uh, killed um, in real life. Um, now, uh, Shannon Rossman passed this information on to law enforcement. Um, there are, um, so I've put two links up there. I suggest you go and read about it if you're interested. It's really interesting. There are uh, some indications, unsubstantiated, that suggest that the work Ross Miller was doing put her at risk of physical harm. Um, I won't kind of go into those now, but there's some indications that some of the people she was targeting or some affiliates of those people were then trying to target her in real life, which just kind of highlights the risks uh, potentially associated with, with using this uh, against attackers and against bad guys. Okay, so to sum up then, I've put together a detection checklist um, based on what's in this presentation. Um, so this will be on the, the PDF of this talk, which I think it, uh, will go on the website um, at the end of today, is that right? Um, yeah, okay, maybe. Um, but um, I will try and put this somewhere else as well. So uh, the request from me is have a look at this. Let me know if it makes sense. If you have things that you want to suggest adding to it or modifying, then please do let me know. Um, I want this to kind of be available to everyone to use. Um, Rose is kind of quite an uncommon attack vector at the moment, but it's likely that it may become uh, more widespread. Um, so please do have a look through. It's only uh, two slides at the moment, um, but I'm sure there's lots of things that could be added to this. And then in terms of future research, so as I mentioned, this is uh, a fairly new area, uh, and there are some ideas that we have for, for um, looking at this in more detail. So um, the next bit of research that I'm gonna be working on is looking at trying to link together different persona that are operated by the same person based on uh, the methodology and the behaviors, the linguistics displayed, um, and some other bits and pieces. So if you wanna get involved or you wanna know more about that, then please do get in touch. Um, Further research on online deception. So this is quite an active area um, of research, but um, it definitely needs more, particularly in terms of the linguistic markers, I think. Technical detection of deep fakes and things like audio morphing, that kind of thing is a really interesting area. Um, so again, let me know. We're starting to do some work on that um, at PwC, but if you're interested in collaborating or getting involved, then again, let me know. And uh, really importantly, I think, and really crucially, is this concept of personal filters and thresholds um, applied to the susceptibility of falling for social engineering, which hasn't really been explored in the literature at all. Uh, and I think that's really interesting. Uh, and then lastly, perceptual hashing. I just find a, an interesting subject looking at the kind of similarity of images. Okay, so a shameless plug, um, if you're interested in this concept of human side channels of, of very granular behaviors being used to link together uh, people based on kind of activities, uh, I'm speaking at DEF CON on Sunday, uh, track 101 at 2 p.m. on how that kind of approach can be used to link together uh, cyber attackers during network intrusion attacks. 
So some key takeaways for you then. Um, so ROSE is a pretty insidious technique. It's still pretty uncommon. There's only a handful of case studies out there at the moment. Uh, I've tried to kind of highlight the best ones. Potentially, it can be very effective. It does require quite a lot of patience and perseverance on, on the part of the attacker. But depending on the approach, it's not necessarily that resource intensive in terms of, uh, in terms of equipment and expense. Uh, the methods for detecting ROSE attacks are generally untested and experimental. Um, they've predominantly just been used in an academic context, in the context of kind of experiments. Um, but they do offer some promise. They do need some further work um, in applying them in a real world context. I think that detecting ROSE attacks potentially has societal benefits that go wider beyond just protecting organizations' networks, given um, some recent events. Um, and then finally, the ask from me is, do have a look at that ROSE checklist, and if there are things that you think could be added or modified, then please do let me know um, so I can kind of improve that or we can improve that together. Okay, so um, that's my Twitter handle if you want to get in touch. Uh, I've got open DMs if you want to message me. Uh, please do let me know what you thought of the talk. Um, if you've got any questions, then just drop me a line. My email address is there as well. Um, if you uh, need some summer reading, um, as I mentioned, all the references for this talk are in the slide deck, um, so you can go through those at your leisure. Um, I will be taking questions in the wrap room in South Seas H, which I think is just down the hall. Uh, so thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.